a nice, cold, refreshing drink of aspartame. In today's episode of Dr. Noor, I take you through everything you need to know about aspartame and why the WHO are about to classify as being possibly carcinogenic to humans. Before we get started, I hear you asking, what is aspartame? Well, aspartame is a sweetener, which is almost 200 times sweeter than sugar. Oh my goodness, that is super sweet. And the great thing about aspartame is that it is low in calories. So it's been widely used throughout our beverages and our food as a low calorie alternative to sugar, helping us to maybe lose weight and enjoy the foods that we like to have without piling on the extra pounds or the calories. Sounds all too good to be true. Well, maybe it is or maybe it isn't. Watch the rest of the video to find out. But where did aspartame even come from? Well, aspartame was discovered by a chemist known as James M. Schlatter. This chemist was working so hard to find an anti-ulcer drug, and he decided to put together two amino acids or molecules that combine to make a protein called aspartic acid and phenylalanine. And he mixed these together and decided against normal work regulations to dip his finger inside and have a little taste. And he later recalled that actually it tasted really good. And so came the birth of aspartame, a super sweet, low calorie alternative to sugar. Now, aspartame has not been without its troubles along the way. So it was discovered in 1965, and there are a lot of people out there, including medics and researchers, who said aspartame can just simply not be safe. And in fact, there are lots of studies showing how it's not safe, and multiple studies on mice were performed during that time to show that actually aspartame may have an impact on mice, and it may cause cancers of the gut, for example. However, the company that the chemist was working for, known as the Cell Group, working really hard to debunk these claims and actually did their own studies and said, nope, you know what, our studies show that aspartame is actually safe. And there was much backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, is it safe, is it not safe, is it safe, is it not safe, while well, eventually they proposed it to the FDA. And the FDA took it into consideration and reviewed almost over 1,300 different studies to see if it was safe for human consumption. And around 15 or so years later, they decided that actually aspartame was safe for human consumption as used for a beverage, including things like this Diet Cola right here. And aspartame became a global phenomenon. In fact, in Australia alone, over 70% of our aspartame consumption is actually from beverages like this one over here. And it is also included in um, certain foods that could be low calorie foods or even yogurts as well. So it's really important when you are having a look for your ingredients to see if aspartame is listed in one of those ingredients. But let's accelerate now into today's world. Why is it that aspartame has suddenly become an issue for us? And why is it that the WHO, the World Health Organization, have decided that they're actually gonna change the classification into being possibly carcinogenic for humans? But before we get that, let's take a step back. Aspartame is not actually safe for everybody. In fact, children who suffer from the condition known as phenyl ketonuria are not able to consume aspartame. And that is because of that amino acid that we spoke about earlier called phenylalanine. When those children do consume it, it can actually lead to brain impairment or brain damage. So those children unfortunately cannot consume aspartame. So they're brought up their whole life not to consume such beverages that contain that sweetener. Fortunately though, for these children, a lot of them do grow out of it by the time that they reach 10 years of age. So let's take it back now to the general population. Are there truly any issues with aspartame? And what are the studies shown so far? Well, last year over in France, a massive observational study was performed that looked at over 100,000 different people. And they looked to see the risk of getting uh, cancers such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancers with the consumption of aspartame. Now, these researchers drew up some conclusions and said that, you know what, actually we think that people who do consume aspartame have a slightly increased risk of such cancers. Now, of course, aspartame have not been quiet in this, and as such as the history has shown, they've come back and forwards, and they've said that actually, your study doesn't show that the aspartame causes a direct link to cancer, and so therefore we can't listen to your study. A smaller study was performed, which actually showed that if you consume aspartame in your day-to-day -day life, it can actually change your gut microbe, and not only that, but it can also increase the blood sugar level. And when you have an increased amount of sugar in your blood, it can lead to conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and also stroke as well. So you can see there's a lot of speculation about this and whether aspartame is actually safe. And so you can see just from those two studies alone, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more being released very shortly, that there are some potential concerns for the consumption of aspartame. So why do we think that aspartame is so dangerous? Well, it's time for a chemistry lesson. Once you consume aspartame into the stomach, it gets converted in the cut into aspartic acid, aspartic acid methyl ester, and phenylalanine. Then it is that methyl ester that is converted into methanol, which is then oxidized into formaldehyde and formic acid in various tissues. And it is that formaldehyde that we know can be carcinogenic. Back to the video. 
Moreover than that, the WHO have got a classification that looks at lots of different agents and classes them as being group 1, group 2A, group 2B and group 3. And we're going to take a moment to go through those classifications and give you some interesting findings about what common products you might find in each of those categories. The first category, category 1, is carcinogenic to humans. This means that any of these agents, if consumed, may cause cancer in humans. And you'll be surprised to know what kind of agents there are included in this. Well, for example, the first one is alcohol which I guess if you have it in consumption, yes, it certainly can cause liver damage and that can lead on to cirrhosis, which can then lead on to liver cancer. So bear that in mind when you're drinking your drink tonight. Secondly, tobacco. We definitely do know that tobacco can lead to lung cancer. And other products inside this category include processed meat and interestingly, Chinese style salted fish. So what about category 2A? Well, category 2A looks at agents that can be probably carcinogenic to humans. This means that if you have exposure to them, it probably will cause some sort of cancer in humans. And this includes people who work with bitumens, for example, who are doing asphalt or people who are working with those sort of products. Now, category 2B, which is where aspartame will fall into, are agents that may possibly cause cancer in humans or possibly carcinogenic to humans. You'll be interested to find out that there are actually some common household products in this category as well. For example, aloe vera is also found in this category. Progesterone-only contraceptions are also found here, as well as ginkgo biloba. And it also includes radiofrequency electromagnetic fields, which are found from our common cellular devices. So it's really important that when you are interpreting these guidelines to have a real read and think about the exposure limits to each of these items. The fourth category is group three, which are items that are not classifiable as being carcinogenic to humans. And this is really just because we don't know, there's not enough evidence to tell us whether or not these items are carcinogenic to humans. And within this category, you'll see things like drinking coffee. Yes, shocking, I know and also hair colouring products and dental materials. So there's a brief overview of the different groups that the WHO classify for different agents, including aspartame. But what's really important to know is that the WHO doesn't quantify the risk and it also doesn't give recommendations as to your recommended intake. So then we can go on to the exposure limits set for these products, including aspartame. Now, each country has its own acceptable daily intake of an agent. And it's really important that wherever you are in the world, you have a look at your own country's acceptable daily intake for a particular product. For aspartame, I'll take you through a few countries that have got acceptable daily intakes. So in the United States, foods are regulated by the FDA, otherwise known as the Food and Drugs Administration. Now they set an acceptable daily intake for aspartame as being 50 milligrams per kilo of body weight. In Europe, however, and in Australia and New Zealand, this limit is slightly lower, and that is 40 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Now, how does this equate to real life perspectives? Well, let's just say for an average person who weighs 60 kilograms, they would have to consume about 12 cans of a fizzy drink or a carbonated drink that contains aspartame in one day to reach that level of an acceptable daily intake. That is on the proviso that the soda company is actually using the maximum amount of aspartame they can in each can. However, realistically, the manufacturers of these soda companies actually use about three to six times less than what they're allowed to use in their drinks. And so therefore that would equate to having about 36 cans of a fizzy drink in a day to reach your acceptable daily intake. Now, don't know about you, but that is probably quite a hard feat to do unless you're guzzing it down literally one after the other. Of course, it goes without saying that if you're drinking anything close to double digits of a diet soda, then really should be looking at your own lifestyle and changing things around a little bit because that surely isn't healthy in the long run just without this information. Something that I found interesting in my research was that actually Pepsi, which is one of the main competitors for cola, have actually removed the use of aspartame in their products. In fact, what happened in 2015, they decided that they weren't going to use it anymore. Then a year later, they brought it back. And then in 2020, they decided, you know what? That's it, we've had enough, we're not using aspartame. And that is because of their consumers wanting an aspartame-free drink. And so since 2020, they've been using a sulfamide potassium and also sucralose in their drinks. Now, is that a way forward for cola, for example, who do still use aspartame? Not sure, the jury is still out, but surely whenever we get one of these informations from a higher regulatory body, then a lot of shock and panic goes into these beverages companies and potentially there could be room for change. So you're probably thinking, Dr. Nora, I can see that maybe aspartame has got some issues with it and maybe there's some evidence there that it might cause harm, although the companies are really good at fighting back and saying, no, our product is safe. But what are my alternatives or what can I do to keep myself safe? Well, as with anything in life, if you have too much of something, it's going to cause you to have some troubles. For example, if you drink a lot and lot and lot of water, it's going to hyperdilute your body and you may actually have some really nasty adverse effects. And so really the moral of the story is have everything in moderation. You may want to consider, say for example, sugar as an alternative, but if any of you have read this book out there, which is called Pure, White and Deadly by John Rudkin, I would recommend it. Um, it actually tells you that sugar is a beautifully sweet, 
white powder, but it has no nutritional benefit. And in fact, it can cause a lot of disastrous harm for our bodies, for example, from dental caries, from increasing our cholesterol to even increasing our risk of diabetes. So it's all about a, a lose-lose situation, whether you go for sugar or a sweetener. But in saying that, Truly, if you do need to have a sweetened beverage or if you need to have a little bit of sugar or a bit of sweetener in your diet, then really I would recommend having it a very small amount in moderation and keeping well below those acceptable daily intakes. It is so simple for us to get carried away and eat lots of yogurt that might be sugar-free or lots of sweetened beverages that might be sugar-free and not realize how much we're actually consuming. But as with anything in life, whether it's for alcohol or you know tasty foods, make sure you have them in moderation and always lead a healthy and a balanced life style and a healthy diet of course and if you do that then surely your risks of anything nasty happening in the future will be greatly reduced anyway and of course it goes without saying that if you do have any questions about your own diet or your own exercise programs please make sure to speak to your own individual medical doctor i hope you guys have found that video useful and of course as always if you have any questions or comments please don't hesitate drop me a line in the comment section below and let me know what your thoughts are on aspartame and whether you have changed your diet because of what we've learned recently I'll see you on the next one. Take care and stay healthy.